So our goal for, for now is going to be to kind of really kind of take you guys through a process of, of what we do when we're getting ready for uh, examining a truck driver, both at the, at the initial phases in, in deposition and also then time permitting, we'll get into how that changes, what the thought process is and the strategy changes as we're getting ready to try the case. Right. And the, sh the short version, in case we don't get there, is simply that initially, you know, a lot of work goes in before we take the deposition. You can be a lot broader in the deposition where you're mining for what you're ultimately gonna do at the trial of the case. Yes? I agree. Um, so, do you guys all know Jay? Hi. This guy is a phenomenal truck crash lawyer. Thank you. Um, I've watched him grow since he was about this tall. No, I, no. You, you, how long have you been doing this now? 20 years. 20 years, and trucking specific, how many years? 15. Yeah, so he's been around for a long, long time. He do, does, does great work. And um, Joe Camerlengo also is like my little brother, um, my way younger brother, he would say. Um, Eddie here, phenomenal lawyers. It, it just it makes me so happy to see the, um, the the people who have chosen to make this their career, because I know that we're we're getting good results, and we spent a lot of time talking about insurance and things like that, and how to take care of the client. But everybody who you're going to see up here, and and a lot of the people who are associated with the academy, it's all at the end of the day, and this guy too. Mr. Swenson, phenomenal truck crash lawyer, and there's, I'm sure, more in the room that I'm just not seeing right now. Um, but um, it's about ultimately making our road safer, and we're doing it one trucking case at a time. Uh, a lot of us, uh, public service announcement before we go further, is you know, when we're resolving these cases, no matter how much coverage there is, we, well, a lot of us also look for what we call non-monetary terms that were safety terms. So we'll require the company to improve something within their safety culture uh, before we'll go to the table and talk to them about, about the money. So you're gonna have to implement this training or you're gonna have to buy a three-year contract for some of this, the telematics that you saw Joe Camerlingo talk about, forward-facing cameras, rear, you know, uh, driver-facing cameras, all those kind of things. So today, we're gonna do this, and then in some of the breakout sessions, we'll try to apply that stuff as well. Um, so that's really kind of the theme of this, of this program from our perspective, when Jay and I were working on putting it together, was to kind of give you guys a glimpse into sort of the back room of what we're doing as we're getting ready for these. As opposed to just saying, okay, we're sitting down at the depot table, and this is what the actual depot looks like. Because if you just do that, you can't, you can't get the results that we're here to talk about with, with you. Yeah, you know, it, Joe and I talked in putting this together and decided, I mean, it, it's great sometimes and it, it's fun and entertaining to play clips and show you gotcha moments, but that's hard for anyone to recreate because you just see the clip and you go, oh, wow, that was great, look what you got. We'd rather take you, pull, peel the curtain back and show you the slow, painstaking process that Joe and I go through every time we prepare for a deposition. And if I have a truck driver deposition on Tuesday, I'm not prepping on Monday. I'm blocking calendars off weeks in advance, times and time and prep and getting it right because when I'm taking a deposition, I'm doing it with the intent and the purpose of being able to use that information at trial on clips on trial boards, locking in facts, locking in admissions, locking in rules, and it just doesn't happen overnight. All that has to be done before, all that work, all the digestion of all of that has to be done before you ever walk in and sit down, right? And so that's what we're gonna, yep. we're gonna go. I always start just about every presentation I do with this just as a reminder for all of us that at the end of the day, if we don't have this at the end, we're not gonna win. So. Uh, that requires us to kind of park sometimes the, the lawyer, if you know what I mean, the one who wants to be the nitpicky legalism person who comes in and says, you violated you know, section four, subpart G, little I, two. 
you know, and, and you have 400 things. You know, well, remember, we're all trained to be issue spotters when we're in law school. That means you got the points on your test for being a creative issue spotter. You know, it's, it's more creative, the more points you got. Try that shit in front of a jury and see what happens, right? You lose all your credibility. So the idea is just to remember, we, we, we prepare broadly, we present narrowly. Yes? 100%. Okay. 100%. Um, you've already seen this, right? Uh, the idea of, of um, don't make these cases, that's the mantra of anybody who stands up and talks about trucking who knows what they're doing, is don't, try, don't treat these cases like regular car wreck cases. And for those of you who feel overwhelmed by what you've seen, like the first couple hours that we were here, I get it, but it's, it, you can do it. You can do it. You don't have to just hand it off to somebody else to do it. You can do it. If you're, willing to, if you're willing to take the time to learn the stuff, it's learnable. You can do it, I promise you. That, that academy that we've been talking about, now I'm, I'm obviously biased, I started the thing along with Michael Leeserman, but it's a nonprofit, nobody's making any money off that thing. It's all about helping you figure out how to be the best you you can be to, to, take, to take these cases. It's not one of those organizations where it's about you know, somebody trying to take your case from you. But anyway, the idea real quick, and Jay, I want you to comment on, on this next part about the, you know, how, do we, how do we, from a mindset perspective, how do we separate out the truck driver versus the rest of us who are gonna be on a jury? What's that mean to you? I mean, what it means to me is really thinking about and helping the jurors understand that, yeah, we're driving passenger cars, and yeah, we have certain obligations we have to have, but the greater weight and obligation a truck driver has with the size of the vehicle, the weight of the vehicle, the lack of maneuverability and ability to decelerate and brake like a regular car, and the absolute carnage and destruction it can cause if they aren't doing it safely and if they aren't given the right tools by their employer or the people hiring them to know how to do it safely, it's a pretty great responsibility. And to me, the mindset is having jurors understand that difference, because it is a big difference. The duty's the same to act as a reasonably prudent driver under same or similar circumstances, but it's as a reasonably prudent and safe truck driver. And it's a big difference um, but that's the mindset, how do I portray that? How do I, how do I communicate that? Yeah, and, and, and I mean, when you think about it, it's, it I think it, it gives us the why. Why are we saying they, should, they need to be doing something different than what we do when we drive our cars every day, mm -hmm. right? Why do they have to get out before they ever drive and do a pre-trip inspection? I mean, how many people here get up in the, before you leave for work and you, could do your, you even walk around your whole damn car, right? We don't. They're required to go through a very specific process that they're trained on and they're tested on. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to log it. We're supposed to be able to see that they've done it. Um, and they got to do that before they get in the truck. And Are we just picking on the truck driver? Or is there a legit reason? Why do we, when we have these different rules, we're not, we're not approaching it as the lawyer and saying, gotcha, we got a rule. We're saying there's a reason for this rule, right? We don't want to be the nitpicky Folks. And, and the other thing is, I mean, if we are in front of a jury and we're presenting this case, and, and most of the cases, as you know, they're, they're tragic, right? I mean, just small car, big truck, bad things happen, and it's sad. And it's not always, you know, it, you know it, it is the truck driver's fault, but in some essence, sometimes it's not the truck driver's fault. They were set up for failure based on too many hours, not enough training, not enough help, not enough support. And we have to peel it back and be able to tell the jury the why. Show them not the why this crash happened. Why are we here in the first place? Why was the truck driver put here at that position? Why was this truck company put on the road at this time? Who actually hired them and chose to put them on the road? And, and, and the more we can peel it back and back it up, back to what, when Joe um, showed the slide this morning of the transportation cycle, we can actually show the why, why did we even get here in the truck there at that time? So it's almost like the truck driver might be a victim themselves 100%. Of, of a system 
hundred percent. And that's the thought process when I'm preparing for the first truck driver deposition. What's the big picture why if I'm trying this case? Yeah. And, and, and think about, think about that in terms of how that might drive value in your case or how that might make it so that jurors have something more important to think about and more reason to find in your favor. If the focus is on some, some truck wreck that's already happened in the past, and they're going to try to, quote, do justice there versus a situation where this case has uncovered a systemic problem that's continuing to go on. And now the, the, the trial narrative really is you folks are the only people who have the power to change this, right? It's a much different trial narrative. Um, Jay, I'll cover this one thing and then, and then, um, and then, uh, this final point on here about uh, normalize us. Um, in trucking cases, am I the only one who has problems in cases? Like their names are clients, yes? Do anybody here have problem clients? Nobody. Everybody has perfect cases here. My, Man, my law partner, Ron one. Johnson, who's a phenomenal person and trial lawyer, says this shit would be easy if it wasn't for the clients. <laughs> well, our, our friend Pete Kessner goes further and he says, uh, the client is the enemy, <laughs> um, but uh, they'll screw you every time. No, the, uh, so the, but the point here is, is we've got to be making our case about something that's more important than whatever the problem is. And in our case, if, we have, if, we have a, if our person was speeding, if our person made a weird turn, if our person did whatever, part of what we want to do in this process as we're going through here is not forget that these depositions of the driver or safety people later give us an opportunity, if we've thought about it right, to normalize that conduct. It doesn't mean we're going to make it all okay, but we're going to diffuse it. For instance, real quickly, your client's, your client's going 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. Eddie, you've never had that problem, right? Okay, now they're much higher than that, right? But, but 15 miles an hour over the speed limit, you know that's going to be the primary defense that the, the defense is going to be hammering on. So you have an opportunity with that truck driver to say, you're out on this road all the time, yes? Yes. Every time you're out there, you see people going 20, 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. Notice what I've done. He's going 15 over. Yes, has there ever been a time when there haven't been people going 20, 25 miles an hour over the speed limit out there? Isn't that right? And so as a defensive and preventive driver, which is what truck drivers are trained to do, you must take that into consideration when you're making the choices that you make when you're driving. Would you agree? Yes. And I've not made it. If you've got a negligence per se issue in your case, then the, your person's going 15 over. You haven't solved that entirely, but you sure have diminished it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you take this next. Yeah. Um, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, I think. Yeah, so, so we're talking about these yes. depots. You want, so, to, you want to explain so, this? Yeah, so, you know, depending on whether you're in federal court and you're doing a 30B6 deposition or you're in state court and you have your state equivalent, um, I know that those here in California, you all are, are unique, weird people with actually PMK depots, um, but everyone else outside of California, it's, it's, what the, it's a deposition of the corporation and it's what's known or reasonably available to the corporation, it's not a person. And so if you go through um, all the 30B6 stuff, and if you, if you have taken these depositions or you're thinking about taking these depositions, if you don't have Mark Kozarazzi's book on 30B6, get it, literally order it now on your phone and get it. It is a treatise on 30B6 and it is phenomenal. Um, if you ever wanna learn in depth 30B6 depositions, it's on the on-demand for TLU, yes. Mark, the, the book, Mark Kozarotsky, if you just, it's... It, it, just put it, K-O-Z, it'll come yeah, up. Yeah, K-O-Z, if you just Google 30B6 Mark Koz, you'll, you'll see his book in trial guides. Um, but the process is, when you're preparing for these depositions, is to, to know the rules and to draft a notice. It starts with the notice. And I will, I will spend a week just drafting my 30B6 notice of the topics or matters of inquiry that I want to cover and you have to be specific, you have to be described with reasonable particularity, um, 
and you can't just say any and all. Any and all is, object is actually a violation based on the case law. You have to say, example, what I will do. I'll do a notice on a topic. Uh, truck driver Ed Sirimboli. Defendant Sirimboli. That sounds really good. <laughs> Defendant Sirimboli. Top and then subcategories A. He answers to that, actually. He does. He does. <laughs> he does. You know, the hiring, in, the hiring process. B initial safety training, C, annual certifications and reviews, whatever it may be, I will itemize it. I do a step first that some people don't do, I don't have time to talk about now, but I do a corporate records custodian deposition of the truck company first. Um, I do a document deposition before I take any substantive depots. I don't have time to cover that now, but, um, but the notice, and I sit and think about what do I really need? And if this case doesn't involve drugs and alcohol, then I don't spend time in my notice asking to depose someone on the drug and alcohol testing. Or if this guy had been, if, if defense Sierra Boley, God, that sounds so good, had been a driver for 13 years for this company, for, I, I, I may not care about the hiring of this guy because he'd been there 13 years. Maybe when they hired him 13 years ago, there were some things different, but he had the track record there. So I will, I don't just shotgun approach. I do a sniper approach. Um, to, to go to the exact issues. I don't mind telling the defense on category, truck company, training or safety. A, left turn training. B, driving in hazardous conditions, i.e. wet roads or snow. I will specify the exact issue that my case is about and I won't just say training on how to drive safe. Well, that's broad, you're gonna get objection. I'll say driving at night in, on wet roads. Did you guys notice Jay kind of get taller and when this guy came in the room? <laughs> Let me. All right. I, 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 I want to really put a punctuation mark on what he's saying. I get, Jay gets, we all get, people say, hey, will you send me your notice, your 30B6 notice? Please, I'm happy to send it, and so are all these other people. But please use it as a guide. When you send one that has everything in it, in a case that, that that doesn't apply. You're actually showing the other side the opposite of what you're hoping to show them. You know, you're hoping to say, look, I know how to do this stuff. And what you're really showing them is, you know how to get somebody else's 30B6 notice. So at least, at least cut the topics out that don't uh, apply to your case. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that to me is, I don't want to, I, I like to say I'm hiding in plain sight. If I do my job right, there's really not a whole lot the defense can do about it. So I don't hide the topics that I'm gonna go. I come right at you, they know exactly where I'm going. That doesn't mean I necessarily give them every document or every whatever, but I, it's, it is absolutely not a hide the ball process. Other quick pointer is, and I don't know how it works in California with the PMK, but, um, but, um, should I get out of the way so you can get him? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, but, but I always make sure that my 30B6 notice has in there something that here at the very end, um, whoops, um, see where it says underneath that where it says this paragraph six does not preclude the deposition of any other or by any other procedure that the rules allow. I make sure my 30B6 notice has something at the bottom that says, if the 30B6 deponent, if you put the 30B6 deponent, I reserve the right to ask them individual questions in their individual capacity as well, in the same deposition. And so what, I, what I'll do, and, and because why? What, what happens in the deposition? You get the objection is what? Beyond the scope. Beyond the scope, right? So, so we can have a fight over it. Ke you know, Kevin, we can have a big fight over it. And, and, and we can all get all of our blood pressure up, or I can say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll reserve that issue for later. I'll take, the I'll take the testimony now, and we can argue later about whether it's outside the scope or not. If it turns out that it's outside the scope, then it'll be, their answer will be determined to be in their individual and, and, and what I What I do, not as necessarily on my records notices, but on my regular substantive 30B6 notices, um, there's two different things I'll do, and, and uh, I'll, I'll try to circle back to the second. The first is I'll do an exhaustive notice 
And then the defense will call, and, oh my God, this is going to, it's going to take three people or four people. And I, I said, let's just break it up. You tell me, you pick, I don't care, because un, un, unlike PMK, under 30B6, I just do the notice to the corporation, the organization, the entity, the LLC, what have you, and it's their burden to pick the people. I don't care if they pick one or pick five. I had one where they picked six. Great. And one of the guys' depots for the maintenance part literally took 15 minutes because it was a bus case and maintenance wasn't an issue. I just had to nail down a couple things. But I don't care. You tell me how many people, and if you need to do it over three days or over a couple weeks, I really don't care. You tell me, and then you tell me what topics they're going to do. And if it's only topic, I did one where it was just uh, the security person on the surveillance system inside a Lowe's store. Okay, I'll just do it, that guy on that. Um, so, so that part, so you know, when the, a lot of people say, well, who, who are you going to put up for this? I need to know so I can put them in the notice. No, you just list the company, the corporation, and they'll tell you who it is, and that's fine. The other, um, the other thing that I'll do is, um, especially if I know I'm dealing with a defense firm who are just a bunch of assholes, um, is in the notice, after I put who it is and to produce it and all the language he cited, I then have a, about a page or so or a page and a half of all the national case law on their duty and obligation of the corporation, not the defense lawyer, of the organization's duty to prepare the person or persons they designate to be their corporate rep. They cannot show up and say the old, I know nothing, I don't know. They do that, but I put that case law in my notice to let them know, hey, just so you know, this is your obligation. And then when I start the deposition, the first thing I do is I give them the no, say, have you seen this before? And usually they say no, and say, but who are you? What's your title? Who put you up? Do you have authority to speak on behalf of the organization today regarding all the topics or topics one through five? And do you agree your testimony is binding on the truck company with regard to these matters of inquiry that you're here for? And that, and I lock them in at the end, I do the same thing, everything you just told me. And if I get beyond the scope and I start to question them individually, and the defense lawyers, oh, no, they can't answer. I said, no, I put in the notice, I can question them individually. Because if I don't do it now, the case law says I may lose my right to do it later. So I'll just ask them individually, and then we can go to the court later to determine whether that was binding or not. Yeah, and I think it's, I, I, you know, some people, the argument against that is, you may not be able to depose that person individually another time. Correct. Now, so you make your own call on what you think is better. I just, I, my, from my experience, it's better. You're right there. You get it done right there. They're not going to go get prepped on it. And, you know, dot, dot, dot. So, so just know one way or the other, you may be giving up something. Make your own call on what you think is, is, is better. But I just look for reasons not to have the fight. And you know it's interesting because you do get no matter how much how much you bold and make it you know 30 point font you have a duty to do this they come in and they say what I don't know well I don't, I don't know I'm not uh. and so it's, it's interesting the you know the old me would get really pissed off about that anybody with the old me yeah no I see one person nodding you guys are full of crap all right um, but uh, um, you know, one thing to consider, I think, is what's your option? Now, you, can't, you can go do what the lawyer, the pissed off lawyer is going to do, which is what? Go and say, go to mommy or daddy, they're, they're called judge, say it's not fair, right? I want an order. And you may get an order, but some judges will go, eh, they don't really care. They're, they don't get as pissed as you are. You do have another option, though. What if you just lock them in? And I don't know. I mean, consider that. Wait, so you, you understood you had a duty to prepare, yes? And so the official position of the company is, let me write this down. Let me write it down. I don't know. Did I say that right? Yes. Would you, would you sign this piece of paper that says, Werner Enterprises does not know, dot, 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 the answer to this question? Yes. And, and, and I'll tell you, you know, what ends up happening sometimes is they take a break and they come back in. The suddenly, guy suddenly knows. It's the most amazing. I had a, I had a premonition. I went to the restroom. The a light opened from the sky, and suddenly I knew the answer. But let's get into this, Jay, yeah. because yeah. Um, I'll start us, if that's time okay. In the first segment? 30 minutes? Okay. okay. So, 
So this real quickly, I mean, this is, we're not going to spend the time to go through each of these things now, but the point is all of these things need to be done. And Jay said at the beginning, you know, I, I have to set out days and weeks in advance to get ready. It's in my world, it's a team effort, right? I have, I have other people, paralegals, and other people who are involved in the process. I need all the work done before I can sit down and get ready for the, for the case. And it's pretty frustrating when you sit down because we all have time management issues, right? You've set up your time to, to do it. You sit down and a few things weren't ordered, a few things weren't, you know, dot, dot, dot. So whatever the systems that you have in place to perfect that, please teach me, come up here, and, um, and you, get, you get where I'm going. It's frustrating, but the idea here is you're going to do a whole lot before you ever walk in. It's the work is really done in that preparation. For every hour that you spend in the deposition, I don't know how many hours you spend in the preparation, and this is after 15 and 20 years of doing almost nothing but trucking. So I know this stuff pretty damn well, and I'm still spending all that time getting ready for it, because it's much more than the content. It's the order of the content. And, it's, I'm, I'm, and, and we're going to get into the more specifics here mm -hmm. on this. But we're considering everything, and we're thinking about what, is, we're try, what are we trying to get to before we walk in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in, in there. We're trying to figure out what really, really, really do we want this case to be about. Would you agree? 100%. And it's not always, in fact, it's rarely the specific incident that happened because there's usually not a whole hell of a lot of heat in that. And our job is to find where the heat is in these e cases. Especially when, obviously, the defense only you know, wants to focus on the crash itself. But especially, there's not a lot of heat there. And it's a case where they admit they're at fault. Yep, we were in your client. We're at fault. The case is only about damages. That, that becomes the big prep part. OK, I need to, when I prep and take this first deposition, I need to rewind the tape of how the truck got there because if it's just about the crash that they admit liability that's a different narrative a different story to the jury than i maybe want to tell yes the question is how long go ahead you yeah I, I mean how, the question is, how long do we think they're responsible for preserving the truck or the trailer? And it, I, think it, I think, you know, shortly after the crash, I mean, if it's not a serious crash and a serious injury and your client's not in the hospital or a fatality or something catastrophic, huh? Torn labrum? I mean, a couple weeks, maybe? If, if the truck's not damaged and, and the truck's back in service, it could be less. I mean, a lot, a lot of times the police will let the truck go yeah. from the scene, right? And, and, and Evans like gets that. destroyed. So, I mean, the more serious the crash, then I think the more serious, the longer they should preserve it. But if you're not getting the letter out, I mean, I, I've had trucks, I mean, it had a horrible crash now that didn't happen that long ago, and the trail is already back in California. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the bottom... So, the, there isn't a really hard, fast rule. That's yeah, the problem. Yeah, there's, there's, there's not a hard, fast rule. That's why, I mean, the, the, only, the rule for us who do this is the first day does not end with the case in our office without the spoliation letter going out. Because I just have this crazy fear that I'm going to have waited one day to, hey, we got it yesterday. We would have preserved it. But, you know, we just didn't get it until today. And, 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 not, you know, and not just, so. real quick. I sent this reservation letter five days after the crash. Yeah. And I got an acknowledgement. Who'd you send it to? To the insurance Do you send it to the truck company? The truck company and the insurance company. Yeah. Well, okay. And they, they acknowledged the letter. Right. Right. And it's, uh, sorry, it's sorry. Right. So I, I send it to the insurance company, the truck company, the truck driver. So if I if I know of where it's towed to, I send a letter to the tow company. Yeah. So so I mean, look. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna come right back to you, but real quick. I mean, I think you know, there's not a hard fast rule for how long they're required to preserve it, except they have to act reasonably. Yeah. Right. So um, you're wanting to show oh. that. Uh, that what they did was unreasonable, right? And, and so that's gonna be the challenge in the case is they knew there was a significant injury, they knew how to get a hold of you, they didn't get a hold of you or something along those lines. Why did they put it back in service so quickly? And now instead of having, you may, you may get a charge on it, 
but you may, but but it's it's getting harder and harder to get spoliation charges. Yeah. Uh, in 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 my experience around the country. Mm -hmm.